Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Spar and Brawl. I hope you're having a decent day. So this interview that we're doing today is part of a Frankfurt School series. So by the time this full interview is released, parts of the series um, should be out as well. So we'll put links to the actual series in the description box. But so for today's um, interview as part of the series, we're joined by Dr. Charles Mascalier, or Charlie, as he likes to be called, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter in the UK. His areas of interest include critical theory, social movements, socialist theories, as well as neoliberalism. And he was just telling us right now that he's currently working a lot on socialism and intersectionality theory. So I'm not sure if you'd like to add something to that, Charles. No, Charlie. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> perfect. So I'll get us going with our first very broad question, which is just your general take on the Frankfurt School. Right. Well, I, I can't help but, you know, ex tell you about my general take by drawing on my own experiences as as a researcher um, as a scholar i mean i stumbled across critical theory after marx right so i discovered marx first then move on to um, really get to know get to grips with critical theory or the frankfurt school um, which i regard who i regard as marxist in many ways western marxist certainly uh, but who are quite critical of Marx in many regards too, right? Because it's a, a Western form of Marxism. It's not just Marxist Marxism, it's a Western form of Marxism. And my general take is that in a way it does a good job at complementing the work of Marx. I'm not saying that it does the job at replacing Marx in many ways. I think there's a lot of complementarity between the two. Um, and my general take of this is that they made a massive um, contribution to engaging critically with, let's just say, modernity, um, but also more specifically capitalism, but that the contributions they brought about in terms of making sense of capitalism and modernity um, are really quite broad and varied because they are different generations of Frankfurt School thinkers. First, that's one thing that we need to really kind of bear in mind is that there isn't just one very homogenous lot um, sharing exactly the same ideas. You have the first generation, which often include Marcuse, Adorno, Horkheimer, sometimes people include Benjamin in there, um, and, and some others, of course, but the key figures are those ones. Then you have the second generation, um, Habermas representing it. Then third generation, you have you know, the likes of, 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 of Nancy Fraser. I mean, even that categorization, I don't think everyone will agree on, by the way. And, and, and I, I am aware also that a lot of what I'm going to say about the Frankfurt School is not going to be shared by everyone either. But my general take on their work um, would be that they were incredibly um, uh, powerful in their capacity to grasp um, the epistemological foundation of um, capitalist oppression um, in Western societies. Um, they were also very much um, keen to show, and the, not many at the time were actually doing that, and this is my own take and my interpretation of this, to show how it is that capitalism altered our relationship with nature. Now, I don't know if this is your own take on the Frankfurt School, and I don't know if it will be many people's own take, but there is throughout the different generation, especially within the first one, I'll be honest, this frame of reference whereby capitalism is thought to have raised humanity above nature, and that this tendency to raise humanity above nature, to actually assume that humans can be higher and above it, right, uh, in many ways, is what has led a range of ways of thinking and being uh, institutions that have been oppressive and repressive for individuals. Um, in other words, there's um, a range of um, um, ways of understanding the world that emanate from um, the modernist form of thought that is itself inscribed in capitalism that lead to repressive institutions. So they've kind of, they were, they were really keen to show the, the, the continuity between ways of thinking and 
particular institutions, right? So you have, for example, um, a very detailed analysis of the work of some enlightenment thinkers like Immanuel Kant, right? Where they actually try to understand and, 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 and trace the origins of the repressive tendencies of modernity in particular ways of thinking about humanity and about the world. And Kant had this tendency to think that, well, we should in many ways repress particular aspects of our own human nature. Uh, we had a duty to hold natural impulses in check in some ways um, for rational thinking to develop. And that is for them repressive, right? Inherently repressive for the first generation of critical theorists. Um, Adorno for, and, and Horkheimer, for example, in Dialectic of Enlightenment make that very clear. Um, they call it um, a particular approach, you know, a, um, they call it an, a, an attitude towards self-preservation rather than emancipation. So for me to say that, um, um, what to tell you what my take is, is that they were really good at showing us the relationship between particular ways of thinking and institutions that emanate from those ways of thinking. Um, Max Weber had been particularly powerful at doing that with bureaucracy, how it is that a particular form of reason led to a particular form of action and then led to a particular bureaucratic institution that was quite, in a way, dehumanizing this iron cage of bureaucracy. They drew a lot from him and actually, you know, explored capitalism more generally speaking and modernity more generally speaking. And yeah, there's so much to be said, but here, um, it's, it's, it's this raising humanity above nature and the implications this has for particular form of, forms of thought and the institutions emanating from them that is really key, according to me, in their work. And I have here just really talked about the first generation of Frankfurt School thinkers, but um, I can try and, and talk about you know, the others at some point. Sorry, that was a Around. No, no, no. That that was great, Hello? and it's fine if we just stick to first generation for now. Yes, and do you have some follow up questions? I was going to say it probably. Yeah, because you mentioned there is quite a lot of variety. Do you think it's fair to even group these people together, like wow. Horkheimer, uh, uh, Habermas, like from later generations to first generation? Do you think it's fair to group them together, or is it better to because some of them are more Freudian, some of them are more Marxist? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's a really good question. I, I think it's fair um, to a certain extent because they were particularly interested in, in the critique of power, um, but that is also a critique of knowledge um, in many ways. And um, trying to, to anchor the critique of knowledge um, or their epistemology and the critique of power relations that are associated with capitalism. I mean, you, you, you can see that through their work, you can see that beyond their work. It's not just the Frankfurt School that do that in many ways, of course, but um, I mean, I, I, I think running through them is certainly this critique of this, this sort of critical assessment of modernity, this reflection on what modernity actually is and what it's achieved and to kind of ground this critique in, 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 in what, one would understand the critique of instrumental reason. Um, and that critique of instrumental reason Weber. is for me, it, the, the, the sort of connecting links between um, the different generations um, and within you know, the generations themselves too. Um, I mean, you see it certainly um, in Adorno, Horkheimer and Marcuse, you see it in Habermas um, with the, 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 the critique of um, the colonization of the life world by systemic imperatives and therefore instrumental reason. And you see it in Honneth to a large degree too. Um, you might see it a bit less in Fraser, I'll be honest. Um, I mean, and by the way, there, there are other members of the Frankfurt School, right? But I, I, am, I am being, you know, focusing on, 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 on some of the key figures here. But you see a bit less of it, I'd say, in, 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 in Fraser. But up until Fraser, I think there's, there was a that's what really connected them. I see. So if I just want to see like your, so your first answer, because I don't want to ask for the same thing about the other main contributions. So one of their main contribution based on what I'm understanding is really thinking critically about the past, like 200 years before them. So from when like kind of capitalism took over in Western Europe and as well at the same time critiquing the kind of 
positivist scientific scientific rationale that accompanied it is that that yeah. i yeah 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 so so what what you have is usually i mean you have um i often say that within the frankfurt school and again i'm going to just talk about the first generation mm -hmm. here because it's it's easier uh, for me here but within the first generation of the frankfurt school you have a critique of instrumental reason i'd say so a critique of knowledge you know um um a form of epistemological take on modernity. And you have also the critique of the culture industry, right? Um, and uniting those is a critique of capitalism as well, of course. Now, those two are not necessarily antagonistic, but this is my way of analytically distinguishing two of the core projects in their work. Um, but you have, you know, at the beginning as well, the critique of um, or, or, or studies on the authoritarian personality, which mm. are quite empirical studies as well. We often assume that, you know, the Frankfurt School is, 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 is just theoretical, but they've done quite a lot of empirical studies. And, and some people have tried to kind of go back to those to try and make sense of Trump today, for example, right? Um, you know, what, why it is that people might be attracted um, you know, to, 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 to authoritarian personalities like Trump or to figures that we find in, in the Brexit camp, et cetera, or populist figures that we find today. Um, so, so, yeah, so, yeah, they were interested in, in, in that at the beginning. And then I, I'd say, you know, uh, from the time they went to the US and then I think they, came, they went back to Germany, some of them at least afterwards, you know, they, they develop a critique of instrumental reason and more full-blown critique of that, a critique of the culture industry. I mean, the critique of the culture industry was really the one that mm -hmm. they developed in the US, right? You know, I mean, that's, that was, yeah, yeah, they were inspired by what, by what they saw in the US to develop that critique, I'd say. Um, but it is, yeah. So it's a critique of modernity, more generally speaking, and then more, you know, of course, by looking and focusing on capitalism that itself unites their critique of instrumental reason and knowledge and the culture industry. But of course, there's more to it. And mm -hmm. I'm just concentrating on the first generation of Frankfurt School here. Okay, no, very interesting. So yes, that critique of kind of culture very specifically, they didn't do that too much while they were in, in Germany then? Um, I mean, I am not an expert on their own intellectual trajectory and biography and etc. Um, and, and, and what they've done. But I think they, they, they've, they've always been critics of culture. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, being developing a critique of knowledge is also being also a, a critic of, of culture in many ways, right? It's, um, but um, it's not the, the culture industry was, in my view, I think something that they were, they, they were interested in developing when, when they were after, you know, after they arrived in the US Both and they teams. saw this world of um, this increasingly commodified world and this world, this consumerist society that for them was um, uh, particularly, well, I, I've got a feeling it was quite a shock to mm -hmm. them, um, you know, to, to land on that. And, 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 and you feel a bit of that shock and you feel a bit of that um, angry response to what they saw in, 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 mm -hmm. in Dialective Enlightenment in that famous chapter, A Culture as Mass Deception, right? I mean, you feel that anger, you feel... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if anger is the right term, but bitterness mm -hmm. potentially as well. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, if, if I may say. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've heard that's, uh, yeah, so go yeah ahead. that's actually perfect for because we were going to like move on to maybe their limitation and criticisms. And yeah, don't you think sometimes they come across as exactly like bitter old men, sort of they're all the young and their new music and their new. Like, I mean, it's famously Adorno's writing on jazz and his stuff. It's just, you know, he's very negative on jazz. And I think rock and roll, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm, it I'm does more, feel like that. Yeah, no, I'm more familiar with the jazz, uh, the critique of jazz, for sure. Um, and they, he was very, um, yes, he was very critical. And people might call it a form of snobbery um, in some ways. People might call it... Um, uh, yes, the, the, it, I, I, I can understand this criticism in many ways. And when I talk to my students about the Frankfurt School, I often talk about this criticism, which they can share. And, um, you know, a lot of studies have shown that actually popular culture doesn't necessarily pass, turn, us, turn us into cultural dopes in many ways. They might have overemphasized that element too. Um, they might have... Um, implicitly drawn a distinction between high art and low art in many ways. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think 
the one that really for me was certainly the, the, the if we want to accept that criticism of snobbery, the most snobbish was, was Adorno in many ways. And he was just not a snob towards popular culture. I think there was a bit of snobbery towards protests and student protests, mm. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I may use the term snob on that front, he was quite, um, he wasn't was really supportive. <laughs> Sorry. He was just a snob. All <laughs> <of them. laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, we could say that. We could say that. Uh, but but he wasn't, you know, in, in the 1960s, Marcuse was incredibly, opti you know, optimistic, I don't know, but incredibly enthused by the protests that were mm -hmm. taking place in France in 68, Germany in 69, wrote an essay on liberation, you know, inspired by those protests in many ways, which, which is great little book. And you can see quite a lot of optimism about the prospects of change. Adorno was always a lot more pessimistic about those prospects of change. And um, he actually um, didn't really think much of those protests at first. And uh, I think he, he thought they were uh, going to lead nowhere. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Gordon, I'm sure, will, know, will be able to tell you a lot more uh, about uh, those particular biographical elements. But um, I, I, my sense is that, generally speaking, Adorno has been a lot more pessimistic about the prospects of change, and Marcuse a lot less. And I'll be honest with you, Marcuse's optimism about the prospects of change, and uh, although he was quite pessimistic in One Dimensional Man, I'll be honest, which was published mm -hmm. in 64, which was before the protests, and Essen Liberation was published after the protests, or while the protests were taking place to a certain extent, right, or written, you know, shortly after they started taking place. And, 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 and he was, you can see a change, a massive change, a shift in, 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 in his attitude. And, and that's what led me to Marcuse. And uh, that's what led me to feel closer, a closer affinity with his work than the work of Adorno, for example, um, whose pessimism for me was always a bit irritating, um, and, and made me question, actually, why? Why engage in critical theory if one doesn't have the hope for change, mm -hmm. right? I mean, why, why, why bother engaging um, with a critique of instrumental reason, a critique of the culture industry, if, if there is such pessimism? What, what is, there, is it just to kind of be critical then? And so, so this is what the sense of, of it being grumpy, bitter, a, a grumpy man, a bitter old man can, can, can be easily developed, right, when we read their work. Because on the one hand, they're critical, and yet they don't think much can be done about, about it. So, I mean, what can you do? What do you do with that? And Marcuse provided me with, with a bit more hope. And, and, and that's what led me to, to think that actually there could be a potential in critical theory to change things, right? And, and to think about what, what those things might be, right? My understanding actually was that central to, uh, to critical theory and the Frankfurt School was also to be normative to a certain extent. So to criticize what's going on and also perhaps suggest alternatives, or maybe I'm, I'm a bit mistaken there, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by normative, and, and, it's to, and there are different, I think, there are different, uh, you know, phases in their own uh, personal biographies, right? I think, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, like, like Marcuse was quite pessimistic for, at first, and then it was, was a lot more optimistic later on. Mm. Uh, I think, I don't know if there might be, might have been the opposite happening with, with Horkheimer, if I'm not mistaken, but you might want to, to ask someone who might be more knowledgeable about that particular issue. But um, what I would say is, yes, there's a potential for arguing that there is a normative dimension in their work. Um, Rob Cannon actually, um, you know, uh, made that, you know, normative dimension really quite clear. Um, I think it's Bob Cannon even. Um, um, but um, uh, there is potentially there, yes, a case for saying that there is one. It, it's just that, okay, there is this normative dimension, fair enough, but uh, why therefore say that, wh why not explore what things might become if, 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 if one engages critically with the world. This is something that's always been at the back of my mind and led me to do my PhD actually. And mm. this is why you know, I, I speak a lot about realizing the political potential <laughs> of critical theory. And it's because of that. It's because I, I had this frustration whereby there's a really sophisticated, sophisticated critique, but no kind of attempt to think beyond what the world is. 
Um, now, Adorno was incredibly critical of that, uh, of that exercise, of, of thinking in utopian terms. Um, in an essay on resignation, for example, I mean, he, he makes that, that view quite clear that, you know, a blueprint could lead to barbarism. You know, I mean, you know, because when, when you have a particular set of ideas of what things ought to be like, and someone is in power and wants to kind of shape the world according to that idea, what we end up is with, you know, potentially with the risk of, of having, you know, barbarism. Again, some form of repressive, mm -hmm. you know, state apparatus. And, and I can relate to this idea, but this is to misunderstand what utopia can be. It doesn't have to be a blueprint. And by the way, my reading of the Frankfurt School at the beginning of my, you know, um, career, um, I, I mean, my, my, my take on the relationship between critique and utopia has changed since then because I discovered the work of Ruth Levitas. And Ruth Levitas wrote a book called Utopia's Method, um, which is an incredibly inspiring book where she claims that utopia does not have to be about blueprints. Mm -hmm. Utopia can just be, we need to accept that utopias are fallible. Utopias are just, um, it's a method, it's a method for change. In other words, it's just, uh, 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 it's just to kind of encourage people to start thinking that things can be different, but it doesn't necessarily tell us, tell them where to go. It might just say, well, look, things can be this way. They don't have to be, but they can be otherwise. And that's what she means by a method. It's a method for change. And, and that really inspired me. And I'm drawing on that to reveal the utopian dimension of intersectionality theory today. And I did that with the Frankfurt School to reveal the utopian content or the political potential of the Frankfurt School of critical theory. Now I'm, I'm turning to intersectionality to do that, but with with Levitas's work, in, you know, informing all that. Sorry. Yes, Sam, no, did, no. You, <laughs> did you want to? No, I uh, kind of answered. That's the. I was wondering by blueprints. Do you mean a plan of action towards the utopia, yeah. or you mean blueprint for the utopia itself? Yeah, yeah. That utopia is itself the blueprint. That utopia oh. is itself what one should. Um, you know, direct everyone's energies towards or, or something like that. It's, it's this image of, of how things could be, right? But rather than thinking that this is an end point, we should think of utopia as the means to an end, not the end, mm -hmm. right? So this is what the method element, in my view, this is how I interpret this, this notion of method, utopia as method. Um, and, and I think Adorno, in a way, didn't really see utopia as a method. He saw it, he reduced it to, to blueprint thinking. Mm -hmm. wow. I see. So actually, uh, before continuing with a bit more of the criticisms and realizing and potential and all this, I just want to take one step back and just ask you if there's anything else about their main contributions that, that you think it's worth mentioning. And perhaps if you could maybe just pick one of them, and we've spoken about a few of them quite a lot, but maybe one of them that you like quite a lot and just talk about his main ideas and then we can continue as we were one of the members you mean yes one of the members okay. and any of okay. the, and anything about the contributions any other main contributions you do any. you think are yeah worth mentioning if not we can continue well there's one thing when I, I could answer these two questions in one go in in a way that so i mean i'm afraid i will leave uh, potentially have the discussion of hammers for others uh, maybe maybe for 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 Gordon, <laughs> um, who is a lot more of an expert on Habermas than I am. I am. I will say this about Habermas that I think, and this is my view, that in a way what he's done was to de-radicalize critical theory mm. um, from um, the theory of communicative action onwards. I don't see a, a person who thinks that structural change um, uh, is both desirable or possible. What I mean, major structural change. For example, I could sense that you know he had, was very critical of capitalism initially, and then from theory of communicative action and the colonization of the life world thesis, he seems to think that okay, well, uh, capitalism should remain because it's been really quite progressive in many ways, and but it has to remain within the system, right? So let's keep it. Let's keep it within the system, and let's erect a dam or a wall between the system and and the life world. But this is to misunderstand capitalism, which has to expand and expand and expand. It is inherently, and, and, and for me, 
it, it can't happen, right? Capitalism, you know, will always want a need to expand somehow. And neoliberalism is a good example of that. You know, I mean, neoliberalism has you know, led to the further privatization, commodification of life, right? Um, universities now, um, degrees are commodified, for example, all forms, organs are commodified, I mean, the, the law. Anyway, so, so, so I want to leave Habermas aside. I've got a very critical take mm -hmm. on Habermas, I'll be honest. And he's made some great contributions, of course, but I think this is a major problem in his work, right? Sorry. So I needed to say that about Habermas. <laughs> now, you are so much more clear on ha Habermas than Habermas is on Habermas. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> I, I just, but, but I, 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 yeah, I, thanks. Lamp but just, yeah. I hope, <laughs> I hope, it's, I hope it's, um, it's also, you know, uh, defensible uh, enough with this particular perspective. Oh, I, think I, I, I do yeah. think it is. Um, I do think it is. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what others think, right? Um, uh, so what was I going to say? Yes. Um, now, Sorry about that. <laughs> to, to talk about a particular member of the Frankfurt School and to say what their major contribution is. Well, I think Marcuse, for me, as I said, is really uh, the member that I feel the greatest affinity with. But I must admit that I see a lot of parallels between what Marcuse tried to do and what, for example, Nancy Fraser herself um, is still doing um, to this day. Now, what I think is Marcuse's really most valuable contribution, and you can see it in some other works of the first generation of Frankfurt School, it is to actually think quite and to demonstrate the relationship between what I would call environmental domination and social domination. This is for me such an important contribution that Marcuse made and that in fact the Frankfurt School made um, and quite early on they made it. Um, it's this theme, this frame of reference that runs through their work about the tendency of um, um, the domination of um, particular groups over other groups under capitalism like the bourgeoisie over the proletariat or other groups, by the way, okay, it could be the global north over the global south, um, because he was interested in that issue in MSM liberation, or it could be of men over women. Those, those forms of social domination are intrinsically connected to the domination of um, nature by humanity. They're not separate, they're, they, they're intricately imbricated, okay? You can't separate them. The same logic, you know, it's the logic of instrumental action, which is a logic of domination, right? And what is, by the way, I, I kept talking and just talking about concepts at the beginning and not even explaining them. But, you know, what I understand by instrumental reason is a particular um, cognitive faculty, a particular way of apprehending the world cognitively, which is about manipulation and control, right? It's basically instrumentalizing our environment, whether it's people, nature, whatever is part of that environment. So this is why it's called instrumental reason. So when we reason accordingly, um, according to this, in, in this instrumental form, we end up turning others into means to an end, right? Into instruments. Um, and that is problematic because it's not about, it's not, it's, it's quite the opposite of caring for or supporting others. It's more about turning others into the, the object of, you know, your manipulation to objects of manipulation. Um, and that particular form of reasoning is, is, is basically a rationality of domination, which is, which is really um, reflected concretely in the domination of um, the bourgeoisie over the, the proletariat, exploiting the proletariat, right? Turning them into means to ends, or of women by men, um, women being confined to the home, for example, so that men could then um, be able, you know, uh, go on to and, and, and earn the wage, um, for example, although obviously things are a lot different today, but there is still very much this tendency in societies, contemporary capitalist societies that are, are still in, intensely patriarchal. But what we find is, for example, a form of domination within the labor uh, within the workforce, where men are in positions of power and women are not in positions of power, have are more, you know, overrepresented in precarious positions. So those forms of domination, which are social, um, are articulated, are let's just say articulated around 
this instrumental way of thinking, right? And they are also connected to environmental domination, which itself entails humanity treating nature as an instrument, as a resource for to be exploited, to be extracted in many ways. Um, so that's that same logic, right? That same form of thinking, um, the technology we use, et cetera, et cetera, are technologies of domination. Um, the sciences we develop are sciences of domination in many ways. Um, so Marcuse said this, and you can see it um, in many ways in, in a lot of Nancy Fraser's work, especially now. I mean, initially she was coming up with this attempt to uh, grapple with what she called struggles for redistribution and struggle for recognition different types of struggles for justice that can be connected in some ways. And she's been criticized for not connecting them enough, I'll be honest. And there's, there's, there are problems with that, but at least she tried to connect them. And now she's trying to connect those with the struggle for, um, you know, um, against environmental domination. So she's very much aware lately of the need to find connections between those different struggles, which is itself what Marcuse was trying to do. So a major contribution is this, developing a conceptual framework that allows us to think across those different struggles that you find in Marcuse, but you also find in some ways developed somewhat differently in the work of Fraser. Fascinating. So, I mean, this has kind of just made me think of Eros and Civilization, which is kind of mm -hmm. his, uh, his mm -hmm. first and probably only book that I read that really got me interested to Marcuse. And I guess, would Marcuse say that this domination that we have over nature and others and I think maybe this is where Freud comes in does he say that some of it might be necessary for humanity but we're doing it too much like we're doing it excessively for no reason not for like it's not that it's necessary but we're doing it for exactly exploiting nature and others very interesting question so my, my answer to this is that the way I see I interpret Freud's civiliza civilization and his discontent, right? This is where he actually says mm -hmm. we need to a degree of repression to be able to have, you know, civilization, right? Um, I'd say the way Marcuse interprets this is that capitalism leads to surplus repression, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, that's, that's, that's the, that's the problem, um, that there is a surplus and that capitalism can't exist without this surplus repression. So this is why we need to actually move beyond capitalism. And this is a radical way of thinking, but that isn't shared, by the way, by Habermas, I don't think. I, I, especially not the Habermas after theory of communicative, communicative action. Um, and, and yeah, this, anyway, sorry, I, 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 I'm going back to this, but it's a major distinction between, between I think, Marcuse and the second generation um, of Frank Vosgo, especially Habermas's work. I always yeah. uh, thought instrumental reasoning is just basically, at the end, it becomes profit-seeking and control, like psychiatry or environmental issues. It just feels like at the end, it's just that's the... That's the end point of instrumental reasoning. I don't know if that's a fair enough assertion or not. I mean, I'm going to use Habermas positively here and, 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 and read okay. it um, in, with, with the Habermas's take. So the Habermas says that the colonization of the life world by um, the system, um, and the system contains the economy, um, politics, the political apparatus, the, the bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's it's really about kind of like control and 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 satisfaction of needs, let's just say. And then it distinguishes it from the life world, where it is that where we develop our personality, where we develop norms, social norms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where we find morality. Okay, um, and the colonization of the system by the life world is is med is is let's just say mediated by money and power. So the spread of instrumental reason. Um, so instrumental reason is not money itself, but it's mediated by money. Let's just say it spreads through the spread of money, right? So there is a com an affinity between instrumental reason and thinking um, in money terms because it's about calculation, right? It's a calculative rationality in many ways. Um, and, 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 you know, when a world dominated by money will be a world also dominated by instrumental reason. Right? So an increasingly commodified world is a world that is also increasingly instrumental rationalized. Mm -hmm. I, in my view, that's, that's how I interpret it. Is how, yeah. Yeah. 
I, I wonder whether others might disagree or not. <laughs> So, I mean, maybe just going back to the criticism now. So we talked about snobbery a bit. I see here in our questions, we had that perhaps the criticism that their work is not scientific enough. But are there any criticisms that you find to be um, particularly either fair or unfair of the Frankfurt School? Um, well, I, I, there's something that I, I really would quite like to tackle. Um, and there's a criticism that's a really quite... Um, current at the moment, which is the fact that their the critique of modernity and the critique of capitalism re remains within the confines of modernist forms of thought. Um, you know, you have this project of decolonizing the curriculum, and, and that will involve, to a certain extent, um, you know, moving beyond the work of, of Marcuse, or at least, you know, all complementing their work with the work of others. And um, I, I'm completely in favor of that, if it's done well, and for it to do well, you know, you, you can't do it within the confines of, of a, a very marketized university. Um, and it's interesting because Mignolo, a key figure of, of decolonial thought, Walter Mignolo, um, actually said you can't get a research grant that, that allows you to genuinely decolonize the curriculum, no matter how, because <laughs> that, that, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't appeal to any government in any way, shape or form. But um, so, so yeah, so I had to say this, um, but um, I, I, the, 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 while I accept that criticism, that it remains within the confines of um, Western forms of thought um, and modernist forms of thought, although they're critical of modernity, right? But yeah. it remains, they're using the, the tools offered by modernity and modernism to be critical of modernity, right? So, 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 so th 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 there, there might be problems with that. I mean, can you dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, as Otto Lord would put it, right? Mm -hmm. um, potentially not. So you may need other tools for that to happen, and I accept that. But what I don't accept is when you have actually people being critical of the Frankfurt School um, and claiming that, no, or critical of Western critical theories, generally speaking, for not being able to um, offer good enough conceptual tools to make sense of the problems that they cause. But I think that actually that's not fair to the Frankfurt School. I think it's important when we decolonize the curriculum and think about decolonial thinking that we don't just reject those particular forms of thought or ignore them. Um, uh, we might want to provincialize them, not to make them necessarily the center of analysis, but to see how they might compl be complemented or to see how different critiques of modernity, Western, you know, within, you know, um, Western societies and modern societies um, and critiques of modernity outside of those societies can actually work together to kind of move beyond the problems they identify rather than establishing a sort of division and a sort of wall between us and them, right? In many ways. And, and it's really, I think, absolutely essential um, to work together, to kind of to, to engage in a dialogue rather than um, and 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 of course, I'm not saying we should absolutely use necessarily the work of Frankfurt School thinkers, but if you think about this relationship between social domination and environmental domination that Marcuse really placed at the core of his critique of capitalism, you find very strong affinities here with um, um, Latin American or South American um, forms of decolonial thought who actually want to be, who are critical of coloniality or the coloniality of power, um, you know, as, as Quijano uh, put it, um, at the same time as being critical of how it is that the coloniality of power might be instrumental in you know, uh, the, the exploitation of nature. So there is connection here between social domination and environmental domination that is found in decolonial thinking and also in the work of Marcuse or critical theorists. And I think it's, it, it would be really quite, it would lead to really interesting and rich and, and creative ways of thinking across struggles to try and think about across those different forms of thought. Right of of and 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 to include them within 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 a more generic generic critical theory rather than just assuming we've got decolonial theory and then we've got critical theory. I don't think that's constructive. I think what would be more productive would be to find a way 
you know, parallels across them and just to see how they, they complement one another. I see. Yes. And definitely, I mean, I think even nowadays, his whole criticism of saying social and environmental domination, it should be very relevant nowadays, too, because you hear it a lot, but perhaps it's not linked directly to Marcusa. Yeah, go ahead. Son. So uh, this actually was very interesting because right now there are apparently courses even in the U.S. that try to like they've tried to, uh, you could argue, purge like Western Marxism because it's Europe too European centric. I um, is that the type of walls you're talking about that you know complete rejection of okay because these guys were from Europe we can't engage with their theories that type I, of thing? I accept the charge of Eurocentrism and I accept the fact that we you know West yeah. you know uh, we you know, Frankfurt School thinkers should have really kind of expanded their horizon a bit more totally and I accept so much more than that in terms of the problems associated with the Eurocentric dimension. Um, uh, yeah, what, what I'm trying to say is that while it is really important to highlight the limitations of Western form of those, if, if you're critical theorist, let's just say if you're a critical theorist, if you're critical of capitalism, right, what good is it to, um, let's just say, um, oppose your own critique of capitalism to other critiques of capitalism, what, what, wouldn't it be better to try and really work together? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to, to do, so this is my point. So it can go, you know, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily those outside the West, you know, erecting walls and things like that. It could be the West, the West has anyway erected walls, you know, throughout its own kind of, you know, it's only now that we're trying to remove those walls really, or, you know, we find it quite difficult, especially given the state of academia uh, these days. But, you know, um, so, so I'm not blaming any sort of kind of, you know, school of thought for erecting walls, but it's important to just know that, to just avoid at least, you know, um, uh, avoid making statements or making, um, developing critiques that would end up erecting such walls or that would imply the erection of such walls that's 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 my point and you know i think it's there's a lot to be done to work across different knowledge projects um you know across the world to to develop a, a you know a critique of it doesn't mean to homogenize it necessarily because it's i really believe in this notion of pluriversality that you find in decolonial thought right the pluriverse which is to kind of give scope for different perspectives, right? And to respect and to tolerate difference, to stop trying to universalize particular forms of thought, which is what modernity and modernism has tried to do. This is why, this is what, you know, the likes in some ways of the Frankfurt School have tried to do to, to kind of, but although, again, the, the first generation of Frankfurt School thinkers were really quite attuned to this relationship between particularity and universality and to try and strike a, a really kind of healthy emancipatory balance between the two, right? Um, and I think their attempts could parallel some of the attempts that are found outside. Um, so, but it's true, that, you know, you know I, I, I'm not going to dispute the fact that mod modernist forms of thinking, you know, do tend to favor universalism over particularism. Or universality over particularity. There is that inherent tendency within that, in my view. I see, very interesting. So I wanted now to fast forward a bit to, um, to let's say right now. So you have this paper where you talk about Occupy Wall Street, and you kind of mm -hmm. is to, the question is to really see how relevant the Frankfurt School still is to conceptualizing modern movements. And so I wanted to ask you how relevant you think this is while taking into, I guess, the paper is kind of articulating and fighting back against the criticism which is made. Well, Marcusa themselves, based on what I understand from the Frankfurt School, they said, OK, actually, we've reached a stage in capitalism now where at least in the Western world, there aren't material issues. Right. So some people say that the Frankfurt School isn't dealing with material issues as Marx did. However, now that we look at it right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. And there are still a lot of material issues that need to be taken into consideration. So having said that, I don't know how much if you agree with that or not, if I characterized it um, well enough. But anyway, my question was just like, how relevant do you think their theory and Frankfurt School main ideas remain for analyzing contemporary movements, whether it's Occupy Wall Street or maybe you want to even pick something even more? 
contemporary, I, if I you give an example. Too. Yeah, I mean, there's Occupy Wall Street, you can see, you, I, I would include the global justice movement or alter globalization movement. I would include even potentially Black Lives Matter, um, a, a more contemporary uh, global movement. Um, so I think there are there is relevance of their work to those, but the relevance lies in this, in my view, that within the work of first generation Frankfurt School, and especially, as I said, the work of Marcuse, there's this kind of frame of reference that we can work with to try and work across and, and understand how it is that different struggles can actually potentially connect um, uh, one another without eliminating their differences necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I think, really quite relevant to some of the challenges that contemporary global social movements face, like the global justice movement, like Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter, which are movements of many movements. I mean, Black Lives Matter, yes, is an anti-racist movement, but it's also more than that. I mean, it, it, it has include, it, it, it sought to include also, um, you know, um, uh, the fight against tra um, transphobia, for example, it it sought to include a range of issues that are not just police brutality. Are, yeah, police brutality, absolutely. That 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 are connected to race, but that, that that are not reducible to race, if you see what I mean, or to racism. Um, and uh, I think you you know, but examples like Occupy Wall Street. I mean, one of the strengths of the movement, and this is not what I said. It it was said by I think. Um, other thinkers, um, um, including my friend Matt Dawson, I believe, um, but also potentially, um, um, I think, uh, Calhoun, Craig Calhoun. Um, one of the strengths of the movement was its internal diversity, right? It was a struggle of many struggles, which is a term that Naomi Klein used to define or to explain what the global justice movement was like, but that is certainly applicable to the Occupy Wall Street movement. It was a movement of many movements with a lot of different protesters protesting for a, re a host of reasons. You had um, the core of it might have been anarchists. Yes, um, you had David Graeber, for example, being quite instrumental in that particular movement, a key figure in there. Um, 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 but, you know, you, you also had environmentalist movement. You also had, you know, um, feminist movement. You had you had a range anti-racist movement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a range of movements. It was a movement of many movements. And when you have that, what you want is to kind of potentially think, OK, well, what, what might unites us in our diversity? Um, what might unite us in our diversity? And, 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 and I think, you know, they try not to do that too much uh, in many ways. They, they try... Which is which I can understand. They didn't want to kind of put a list of demands together, um, which in a way was a strength, but was also a weakness. And I think, you know, conceptually, the work of Marcuse um, could help us potentially find ways of uh, moving across those different struggles and finding um, common ground. And I don't like the word common, but but at least you know, um, if not even sharing, it, it, the term sharing is not good enough. I think it's, it's because I, I don't want to, I don't want it to become something that um, um, in some way eliminates the difference. Um, but to find how it is that we might turn this diversity or plurality into a proper force for change, and I think to think that there is a connection between how it is that we treat nature uh, or non-human nature right, and how it is that we treat humans, to find that there's a connection between the two is, is one really important step towards um, formulating a coalition of struggles or developing, sorry, a coalition of struggles. See, so the relevance is, uh, is really for you, it goes back to kind of one of the main things that you liked about Marcusa, which is seeing the the, the yeah the connection Unified. between all these different forms of domination. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sam, I think you wanted to ask this next question yourself, so I guess it's you crazy. can go on about the the culture war. I mean, we kind of talked about. Oh, that, we but... kind of talk about it with the yeah C CRTN stuff. So yeah, I, I think we covered that. Do you want to move on to the next one? If you want to, uh, our next question yeah, sure. is very like specific and academic, which is kind of what is emancipation? So I guess what is meant by emancipation by the critical school of yeah, That's Frankfurt a big school. question. <laughs> um, it's a big question. Um, uh, but if, if you don't mind, do you mind me just going briefly over the critical race theory thing? Please, oh, please. Yeah, oh yes, no, definitely. Just to clarify my position on this. 
I think it's absolutely in, an incredibly um, important. Um, I mean, so so what's important is to kind of distinguish de decolonial thinking from, for example, critical race theory, um, from other bodies of thought. You know, that are quite critical of the West in many ways, um, um, but that can be inside of the West or outside of the West. Someone that does a great job in trying to kind of show how they might be, in a way, brought within a, a, a project, a communal project, is Walter Mignolo in Decolonial Investigations, for example, um, where he recognizes that actually, I mean, critical race theory really informed what is now known as intersectionality theory, right? Okay, uh, for example, Kimberly Crenshaw um, was is a critical race theorist, but she's coined the term intersectionality. Um, and that is a critique in many ways of West and Western epistemologies, you can say, you can say that actually intersectionality can be also a critique of, of an ontology, of Western ontology. There is the potential there to be critical of this particular notion that we are all um, bounded, um, com, you know, adversarial individuals. Um, intersection is about intersection, understanding how things intersect with one another. Yes, how structures of power and oppression intersect with one another, for sure, but how we might too, as human beings, um, interrelate in many ways. And there's, there's, there's within intersectionality theory um, um, which is actually the ones emanating from the global south a lot of the time. For example, Anzal Duya's work or Cherry Moraga's work, um, they, they tend to kind of look at intersectionality as, as an ethics of interrelatedness. Um, it's Anna Louise Keating, I think, that, that's, that's the way she describes it. Um, that, that, you know, we, we, we think of individual interrelating, that we, actually my own identity um, is very much um, that my own freedom, my own emancipation, and I'll come to emancipation in a minute, is realized through others in many ways. It's not just that my freedom is separate from yours, it depends on your freedom in many ways. Um, that my identity is not just separate from yours, but actually, you know, to know who I am, I, 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 in many ways, I, 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 need, I need to know who you are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's a different perspective on the world in many ways. It's a different way, it's a, a different way of making a new way of thinking about the world and a new way of being in the world. So there's potential in there to think along those lines and therefore very strong affinities, I would argue, with decolonial thinking, um, as Walter Mignolo kind of um, showed, but also potentially, I think there are very strong parallels will, with the Frankfurt School too. Um, but anyway, so um, emancipation, goodness me, right, yes, <laughs> what, what a term. Um, again, there might be quite a lot of people disagreeing with my take on this, um, my understanding is that it comes really from um, uh, the period of slavery, when, when we were talking about the em emancipation of slaves, right? So it was a term that really was about freedom from bondage, right? So it's when I think of emancipation, the image I have often is removing the shackles, right? And um, then, I mean, I, I, that's for me the, the core of what emancipation is, to... There's an element of liberation for sure, but I distinguish it from it in many ways, because when you think of some liberation movements, um, a lot, some of them like the gay liberation movements um, might have been quite satisfied with just having rights, new rights, rights that are equal to the rights of heterosexual people, for example, the right to marry, right? Um, and for me, that's not emancipation. For me, that's um, a form of liberation. That's 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 gaining rights. That's a form of equality, but it's within the system as it is, right? So, and many people actually would argue that gay marriage, for example, people who would um, people, someone like Lisa Duggan, who came up with the concept of homonormativity, um, not heteronormativity, but homonormativity, argued that this. Um, the gay marriage is, is, is an assimilation of gay people within heteronormative culture. Um, so it's not a form of liberation. If anything, it's kind of like, it kind of like undermines their emancipation. Because it's a leverage buyout, isn't it? It's yeah. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of you're <laughs> buying into the to system. Use an interesting terminology. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
it's, a, it's an interesting way of looking at it, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, so for me, emancipation is more than that. It's emancipating oneself from structures of oppression um, and, 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 and adding rights or making someone equal to those who oppress, you know, in many ways who, who oppress them, is not for me a form of emancipation. Uh, a form of emancipation is giving them the possibility to have control and to actually shape the norms as well. Um, and they've also shaped the institutions too. Um, and, and that requires systemic or structural change. So for me, emancipation, um, the way I see it, it, it entails a systemic or structural change. Um, and I think the key thing to, to, to concentrate on is to understand how the program, a program of emancipation might work across different types of struggle um, uh, without necessarily reducing one to another, but just to understand how it is that different struggles might combine together to kind of lead to the emancipation of different groups, mm -hmm. right? And that means, therefore, to a change of structures and institutions that reflect the interests of those particular groups. I see. So, I mean, no, that sounds very interesting, and I actually agree with that, but it just made me think that, I mean, you can kind of say the same thing then about slavery. You could also say that was a kind of liberation, right? I mean, if you take slavery in the U.S. specifically, right, because, I mean, you want to you want to have the same status as everybody else, but then you're kind of part of the system. I mean, I was just thinking in the way that we mentioned, you know, um, gay rights I, liberations. Well, actually, like there are historians, Gerard Horn, for example, kind of argues that sort of you could argue some of the black lead, black liberation movement leaders sold out the international community for the black people at home. So, you know, I don't, I mean, this is just, sorry. So it's no, a bit of a tangent, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. Um, I'm no expert on that period of history, but of course I have some knowledge. And, and, and there's, a, there's a, the Du Bois's work, um, um, mm. uh, you might be familiar with his work and um, who really was about uh, one of his greatest works um, from what I'm aware of and, uh, and absolutely enjoyed it was um, the work, his work on reconstruction and, and, and he makes the claim that, you know, part, part of the claims he makes at least is that uh, it didn't really get uh, emancipation of, 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 of Black Americans, you know, at that time, you know, they were not uh, emancipated. I mean, that's, that's, you know, we speak of an emancipation, but in many ways, uh, they were not emancipated. And, and, and this is the kind of thing that I would, I would, I would, I mean, it's obviously not at all to the same degree, or in, it's a different struggle in a different set of circumstances. But this is what I see when I see um, gay marriage, you know, being, you know, uh, or same-sex couple, uh, um, same-sex marriage being, being, being legally enshrined. I don't see this as a form of emancipation either. Um, I, and, and I don't really see it as a form of liberation either. If anything, I, I see it as, a, as an assimilation within a dominant um, a set of, 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 of norms, the heteronorms in many ways. So, um, yeah. So that, I don't know if that answered your question in any way, shape. Yeah, or well, it was so much good. Well, I would, yeah. just to add, Du Bois, I think, even points out that, yeah, Black people were given votes, but they weren't given land. So, yeah, exactly. Like, emancipation is very complex, I would say. I don't, yeah, sorry and, about that. No problem. And I'm guessing for Marcusa <laughs> and for the Frankfurt School, so emancipation would be emancipating yourself from the dominant culture, culture. from the capitalist um, culture, I'm guessing. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch um, that. For Marcusa, for Marcusa and Frankfurt School uh, theorists, yeah. emancipation would be kind of removing yourself from the dominant culture and I guess seeing it critically and trying to move past that then. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it would mean basically um, developing institutions and structures that would give individuals the possibility to realize themselves as not just rational beings, but also being that have instincts and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that have instinctual energies. And um, he, he develops this idea of aesthetic rationality, right? Or the aesthetic form, he calls it, in an essay on liberation, which is a sort of reconciliation of what capitalism had opposed, which is reason and, and, um, and let's just call it instincts, right? So capitalism is about trying kind of its instrumental rationality, mm -hmm. its hope, 
I mean, to a certain extent, it might liberate some some death urges or, or instincts. To, I mean, I think he says that um, that they're, they're, they're quite aggressive and adversarial in many ways. Um, what it doesn't do, though, is allow us to reconcile those rational faculties with um, the non-rational ones in, for example, thinking about technology. I mean, he, he promotes a convergence of art and technology, and he calls, he calls it the aboli abolition of art uh, provocatively by saying that, for example, what we need is to start really allowing creativity to flourish, because with creativity, what do we have? We have a, a reconciliation of rational planning with the spontaneous dimension of ourselves, with this, in, this instinctual dimension of ourselves. Um, so that's my interpretation of it anyway. And, you know, and you, you get a bit of that in Eros and Civilization. Mm, no, definitely. Well, I mean, yeah? It's um, resonating with, fully with me. With the, the, the reconciliation of, of the pleasure principle with, with the reality principle. Civilization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. what really should be civilization, according to, 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 to Marcus. Although I don't like that word. But, you know, that's, that's what should be. Mm -hmm. and that's what society should allow us to, 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 to achieve. Okay, brilliant. So I see that we still have two kind of questions here. And one of them you kind of touched on, really. But maybe you just want to touch it again. So, I mean, it seemed to me, I just read a few of your papers, maybe two of them, but you seem to talk a lot about relevance of the Frankfurt School and realizing its potential. So just kind of what, what makes you write about those two topics? And Sia, go ahead. And yeah, I just want to add, like, in the context of like what's going on currently in the USA, like, as you say, realizing their full potential, don't you think if CRT or that type of theory is rooted in critical theory and intersection intersectionality, don't you feel they focus too much on culture? Maybe they should need to slightly shift a bit more towards economic stuff on the intersectionality rather than just the cultural stuff mm -hmm. to realize maybe their potential. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um Interesting, yeah. Um, so the, the, the potential of the, the Frankfurt School, I mean, I, I call it often the political potential. Uh, as I said, yes, for me, I was a bit frustrated that um, there was this critique and a lot of pessimism that would go with it. Um, and, and for me, I think it's great to kind of think about, you know, how, what, what, what might be the utopian content of critical theory. And I, and I regard this as, as libertarian socialism, which I think in many ways respects a lot of their principles, a lot of their ideas, um, because, you know, when you have someone being critical, for example, of, I don't know, the repressive state apparatus, that the state is too repressive, then surely shouldn't that mean that they would potentially, therefore, I don't know, um, praise a, 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 a political system that has a much weaker state or, or, or even not a state like anarchists might, might promote or libertarian socialists might promote. I mean, that, that to me sounds quite obvious that whenever you have a particular you know, understanding of what's wrong, surely you must have somewhere an understanding of, that, of what's right. And in, in, in that work, critical theory and libertarian socialism, I try to, to realize that potential that's really implicit within there that's laying dormant uh, within mm. their critical theory and, and yeah, make explicit this silent utopia Ruth Levitas would, would do. And, and I hadn't actually read Ruth Levitas's work then. Mm. Uh, I don't even know if it if had been published um, when I finished my PhD either. I can't remember the exact date it was, being, it, it was published, but um, um, I, I read it then thereafter. And I'm like, well, this is what I try to do with, mm. with this. And, you know, I, I, I'm quite I'm quite keen to do that with intersectionality, but yes, to realize that potential, I and mean, I think there's a potential for critical theory, or at least at the time I, I thought there was a really strong potential for it to be um, a force for transform a transformative force for change because of this tendency to look at this relationship between humanity and nature and, and how that might offer a framework for understanding the relationship between social and environmental domination, and how in turn this could inform institutions that are non-capitalist. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, and, and I still think there's, there's a massive potential with that, but I now turn to other um, perspectives that might be a bit more critical of the Frankfurt School than one might, but you know, that, yeah, that are critical of the Frankfurt School and Western forms of thought like decolonial thinking. But I see, in, interestingly, very strong parallels between them. Uh, parallels that are, 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 are not, 
often enough mentioned, I don't think. And in terms of their relevance, well, I think there is relevance. I think I've answered that question, or hopefully when, when we discussed but Marcuse's relevance to Occupy Wall Street and social mm -hmm. movements. And I think that the key relevance is there, really. But in terms of critical race um, theory and, and, and culture and culture and the cultural and materialist dimension, um, it's funny because I've I, 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 I mean, I'm, I, as, you know, I haven't worked on critical race theory all my life. I, I've, I've actually um, got into critical race theory by reading about intersectionality mainly. Um, but of course, they're very strongly connected. Um, I never got the sense, really, that they tended to favour culture over um, material issues. I never really got that sense, which is interesting, uh, mm. because I still identify to a certain extent as Marxist. I, I do, and, and, I, and, I, and I embrace that, that, that label <laughs> in some ways. Or, um, but or that self identity, but I, I when I read the work of Crenshaw, I, I never really thought of it as 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 being about culture, as being about symbols, or as being about lifestyle. It, it, it was about a range of different issues. I think intersectionality, precisely. I think I mean not critical race theory. I mean I'm going to leave because I, I don't know enough about critical race theory to be able to comment on this now, but. Intersectionality, generally speaking, is a particular lens that allows us to see precisely how it is that the material dimension, the cultural dimension of oppression um, intersect, in my view. Um, it's, it's a particularly powerful one. And, and you have that, in my view, as well, in, in Marcuse, right? So there are parallels here. Um, in, uh, but but, but it's, I, think, I think it does it extremely well, intersectionality. And I think this, it is part of why it is particularly popular, and I, there is a danger, and, and, and that's, that's the way it's been presented often, intersectionally as identity politics, mm -hmm. and it's not. So uh, intersectionality is really quite adamant. Everyone should read, I think, um, this bridge we call home, I think. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's the second, it's the edition that follows this bridge called My Back, which was published, I think, in 1983. And then you have um, in early 2000, this bridge we call home, I think it's called that way. Um, and it's edited by, I believe, partly Anz Alduya, uh, who's this global South feminist. And you have very clearly here an attempt to say, look, we are all you know, doing some form of intersectionality here, but it's not about um, identity politics. Identity politics is um, what potentially the, the right wants to portray critical, critical race theorists and intersectionality theorists as. But when you do intersectionality properly, you look at intersections, right? You don't just look at how it is that, you know, my identity might be shaped by a particular oppression. Actually, intersectionality leads to very complex, very creative ways of thinking about identity, which is not about my identity versus yours. Actually, if anything, it opens up the scope of thinking identity as collective rather than individual. And, 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 and to think that, you know, to, to think that it's about culture would be for me to lean towards the, the right-wing critiques of critical race theory and therefore to misunderstand it. Because for me, it's first and foremost about understanding the relationship between the material dimension of oppression and culture. Very interesting. So you also said, if I understand correctly, that even saying that Marcusa and Frankfurt School were only about culture is, is a bit of an unfair criticism. It's a completely unfair criticism. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. What it did, it, I mean, in my view, right? But um, <laughs> to qualify every time. Um, I think what you have is a very, very sophisticated approach to um, oppression that complements the materialist dimension of Marx with, 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 with what they regarded as the missing cultural dimension mm -hmm. um, of domination. And, and, and I think it, it doesn't do that at the expense of the material. I don't mm -hmm. think, I think it, it does that um, by complementing the material one. So they kind of thought that Marx has already done the heavy lifting when it comes to the material well, when it comes part. to the to the critique of capitalism mm -hmm. yeah yeah to a certain extent you could say that um 
um, what 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 they wanted is to extend it to a critique of culture as well, and to show that capitalism is not just mm -hmm. an economic system potentially, but also a cultural system. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, and the intersectionality stuff, yeah, very very relevant yeah. nowadays. <laughs> I think I would add that I think it's just yeah, the cultural stuff is easier to do, so politicians tend to focus on them. So the whole of the movement gets a bit tainted by that so uh, i mean you know, you know exactly yeah there's a really really good book which is again and i mentioned her earlier by lisa duggan it's a small book called the twilight of equality and in this particular book lisa duggan whose work i cannot praise highly enough makes the point that neoliberalism has led to in a way what we call now cultural wars right mm. just turns issues um, just turn everything into issues of culture and identity because it suits it. I mean, neoliberalism is quite progressive. I mean, Nancy Fraser used the term progressive neoliberalism, which I, I hate, but in a way, <laughs> what, what, what it does, because not, there's not much that's progressive about neoliberalism, yeah. but, you know, under neoliberal... Government. Anyone can make money. <laughs> just... oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's progress, yeah. Um, but so, 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 so what, 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 I mean, the, the way... I mean, what neoliberalism has done, right? Okay, many liberal governments have accepted same-sex marriage, right? have made it legal, right? So that, that could be seen as progressive, you know, neoliberalism. That's, that's one example of the way it's progressive. But what it does is that it kind of obscures the material dimension behind all that. Um, but because in, you know, who's, you know, like, there's this, she's very critical of the fact that despite the seemingly, um, cultural progress the, the, there appears to be cultural progress but then at the same time you've got a sharpening of socioeconomic inequalities right so neoliberalism appears to separate cultural issues from economic or bread and butter issues right um, and in fact neoliberalism really operates on the basis of both at once and she demonstrates how for example an issue like same-sex marriage is also an economic issue and it's about promoting the consumerist kind of, we call it the pink pound here in the UK, but it, it, it promotes a consumerist way of thinking. So it's not just a cultural, it's also an economic issue. Um, but yet neoliberalism kind of seems to be showing us really only the cultural side of things. And in fact, it's quite suitable for neoliberalism to just focus on that because its record on economic issues is, is quite, is, or, yeah, economic equality is quite poor. If anything, it has really sharpened it. Um, and neoliberalism is really about the individual and about, um, you know, it thrives on thinking that we as individuals are personally responsible for our own fate. It's articulated around this particular principle. I mean, you know, market freedoms operate along that, those principles. And of course, you know, uh, it, it, it likes to divide in many ways and it likes to think it thrives on on this individualization of social life in many ways, which is more rhetorical than real, because obviously there are still groups, they still exist. It's just that there's this kind of dominant rhetoric of identity and individuals and, and it just, yeah, it, it divides Difference. and occurs a lot of the time. Um, and, and, and it does so really quite paradoxically, despite the fact that actually it unites both cultural and economic resources to be able to, to thrive. Um, anyway, it's it's a very vague kind of depiction of what's in that book, but it's a really good book and it's quite complex in its argumentation, but incredibly powerful. The Twilight of Equality or Inequality? The twilight of Equality, yeah. Equality. No, sounds very interesting. So, Sam, I don't know if you have any follow-up questions. And I think our last question, we've covered it quite a few times. So about your yeah. favorite and least favorites when it comes to the Frankfurt so, School. I think yeah, sure. <laughs> we've touched on that one now. Um, yeah. Well, any maybe obvious. any besides the uh, author? I mean, I forget her name, Lisa uh, Duggan. Uh, D U double G A N. Any favorite maybe authors or least favorite authors out of the current generation that people should maybe look up or not should um, look up? I believe you mentioned Nancy Fraser, if I'm not. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have, you know, I, I think her work is great. There are many problems. And what's interesting is that actually Lisa Duggan provides a, a short critique of, 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 of Nancy Fraser's own take on the relationship between issues of redistribution and issues of recognition. Um, 
there is a tendency here in Fraser's work to treat them as potentially connected, but you know, analytically distinguishable, and in fact, to a certain extent, distinguishable full stop. Um, when in fact, things are a lot more complex. You know, um, cultural issues or issues of recognition are not, you know, are always intricately imbricated with issues, economic issues, as Lisa Duggan would put it. You can't really analytically separate them. It's more complex than that. In fact, it touches upon how it is that intersectionality theorists, a particular strand of intersectionality theorists, theorists thinks um, about um, the relationship between, uh, you know, um, different struggles um, and different structures of power and oppression. I, but yeah, her work I think is great. It's absolutely, you know, still um, there are there are problems, um, but you know, I think I think she's done a, a world of good for critical theory to come. But I, I do think that I would have liked to see a bit more of a, a dialogue with the work of Marcuse and potentially more of a dialogue with with non-Western forms of thought um, in many ways to expand a little bit the scope. Um, now, I'll be honest with you, I'm, 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 I'm feeling particularly interested these days in, okay, intersectionality theory, and especially what Patricia Hill Collins calls intersectionality as co-formation. So, by the way, can I just say, if I may, that Patricia Hill Collins published a book recently in 2019 by Duke University um, called Intersectionality as Critical Theory. Mm. Um, and there is this... I, I, I completely buy this argument. I was, I think it's an incredibly inspiring book. I use it a lot in my research now. And it makes a really compelling case um, um, uh, for, for regarding, you know, intersectionality as a form of critical. She does discuss the, the you know, the work of um, the Frankfurt School briefly in there. She does also, you know, mention the fact that it's a very Eurocentric way of thinking. But um, so her work's great. And the work of decolonial thinkers. There's a great book that just came out recently called Decolonial Ecology. Decolonial Ecology. Now, I, I would call this a form of critical theory. And decolonial ecology is what well, colon, coloniality connected with environmental domination. There's something really quite Frankfurt School, not, not that the Frankfurt School came up with this way of thinking, mm -hmm. right? It's been there already in the Western community yeah. outside the West for so long, right? Um, but in many ways, it's, it, you know, it's, it resonates with, with the Frankfurt School. And yeah, it's, it's a brilliant book. Um, and I would call this a work of critical theory. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I do really you know, want to think of critical theory as this very rich, diverse um, uh, form of thought that is not reducible to the Frankfurt School. I, I mean, I completely agree. just want to say that exact anything, to be honest, I think worth reading in social sciences has to have some level of intersectionality because they are like, you have to, what are you discussing unless you're discussing culture, economy, society, and groups, whatever, races, if there are such things. Uh, so yeah, exactly. It's just intersection. It's a, I mean, you can agree or disagree with the conclusions, but the method is a pretty, I think it's a pretty good one. I mean, I I, it's, it's an inescapable now, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. And, 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 you know, thinking in silos. Inescapable, yeah. Yeah, thinking in silos, thinking, you know, um, in, in struggles or ways or, or, or structures of power separately from one another, this is not really possible anymore. And, and I think part of the reason why we don't think along those lines is because the relational character of, of, of social theory and, and relationality, which is a, a core element of intersectionality theory, by the way, and that's what Patricia Hill Collins you know, says in her work quite explicitly, relationality. This, this is really very much um, key to the way um, new theories um, you know, apprehend the world, um, new social theories apprehend the world. Now, it's, it's, it's absolutely key to them. It's, it's a major feature of contemporary uh, very contemporary um, social theories. You find out in actor network theory. I don't know if you're familiar with that in, in sociology. Um, oh, which yeah, is the work yeah. of the work of Bruno Latour. But what's interesting is that the work of Bruno Latour that is about networks, about the human and non-human side of things. All of that already existed decades, if not centuries ago, outside of the West, in South America, in communities in South America, um, and 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 elsewhere. Ancient and Greece. Have, sorry. 
ancient Greece, maybe? Yeah, potentially, I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, I, I'm no expert in ancient Greece, but but certainly outside of the West, at least. Um, and Amerindian form of thoughts, although they're quite internally, they, they, they're not, they can't be homogenized in one lump form of, of thought or knowledge. Um, many of them tend to have this kind of very relational way of understanding the world. Um, um, and uh, that, that echoes what this Western man called Bruno Latour actually has said recently and claims to, he claims to be reassembling the social and revolutionary and social theory. Well, it already existed a while back, mate. Um, so, 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 so it, it's it's really interesting. All, all these conversations are conversations I'm having. You know, I, I think there needs to be a lot more dialogue. It's starting to happen. Um, but yeah, um, relationality is certainly an absolutely key feature of what's going on. Yeah. Here now. No. Yeah, that's, I mean, coming from a different culture, not from the West. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would say that the modern critical thinkers have made what existed in literature and philosophy, they made it a bit more tangible and more systematic, like what you would have found in poetry before. Now you find in a, a specific prose that it's helpful to unartistic people like me, but... You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that you're talking about poetry, but there's a lot of images and metaphors that are used, actually, especially intersectionality. There's a lot of metaphors that have been used um, to kind of explain what intersectionality is like. And it's, there's, there's a, a certain poetic um, form in, 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 in the way it's delivered, actually. It's funny you said that because I, I've, I've come across those, those, that, that feeling about it or that thinking I mean, about it. You could argue Goethe was like... I don't know, German idealism and then German idealism led to Frankfurt the school. So they have roots there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who knows? But I, again, German idealism, don't don't ask me much about that because <laughs> All right. All right. I, did learn, I did I did I did I did do quite quite a bit on this <laughs> to be able to know about the Frankfurt School. I mean, you know, Hegel's, you know, ideas, for example, I had to be done, but I, I, I must admit, it, it, it's, it's now really more the Marxist, Western Marxist, and, you know, kind of, move, I, I'm not going back to those anymore. I, 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 for some reason, I, I, I don't it's feel enough. like I want Please. to go to. <laughs> I don't think I need to. I don't think I need to, I'll be honest. I see. Okay. All right. Great stuff. A anything else, Sam? No. Thank you so much, uh, no, for Yes. I just you so added much. some questions. There. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No Anything problem. you'd like to add, Charlie? Or no, not at all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving that scope. I hope I hope there was um, sufficient clarity in the way things were explained. I I, I think uh, at the beginning I I did go and, and drop quite a lot of terms and concepts right. without really explaining them. And sometimes you assume knowledge, and I and I and I hope that eventually they got clarified somehow. It made sense. But yeah, thank you so much for giving me that chance to talk to you. No, I think it was all good. And yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And we'll see you in our next video. Thank you.